Well, I'm very happy to be here this afternoon and welcome you all. They, we, we, uh, the BioSelf Company, are, are great supporters of uh, Remediation Workshop. We are a sponsor, speaker, and an exhibitor today. And uh, we've really enjoyed the opportunity to speak around the country at audiences like this. Before getting started, I want to take just a minute to talk a little bit about the BioSelf Company. We're actually a pretty new company. We were formed in uh, 2010 for the purpose of purchasing the BioSelf pink water line from the inventor and founder of that product uh, some 30 years ago. So while we're a new company, pink water is actually a very old established product. In fact, it was originally developed in the 1970s for firefighters so that they could safely control fuel spills on roadways. And I think earlier somebody asked about why it was called pink water. Well, the firefighters wanted a product that was visible when it was applied to the spill. So they asked that a dye be put into the, uh, the formulation so that when it was uh, sprayed through a fire hose, they could see it coming out of the fire hose. And rumor has it that it was uh, that the first time they used it, some firefighters said, we got pink water, and that was the end of it. It's uh, history from now on. That's why we called it Biosol Pink Water. As we'll see, it's still a very important uh, tracer dye in today's applications that include soil remediation. Biosol product line now includes both pink water, it's kind of the uh, uh, foundation product, but it also includes uh, Biosol Clear, the same product without the pink dye, fog wash for food service and uh, commercial kitchens, and our newest product, Activator, which I'll talk a little bit more about as we uh, go through the day. So pink water is used in a wide range of applications. Certainly what I'm going to be talking about is groundwater remediation, soil remediation. But over the years, many different kinds of customers have tried pink water on other applications, including bioremediation, surface cleaning, vapor suppression, equipment cleaning, and tank cleaning, all with the objective of controlling hydrocarbons with water. That's what we do well. Our product is a very strong emulsifier and it's used to be able to control those hydrocarbons with water. Surfactants actually have a long history of removing oil from the soil. If we go back in time, surfactants were used many years ago. In fact, the first patent was issued in 1927 for the recovery of crude oil with, uh, with surfactant enhanced uh, recovery. So is it any surprise that today technology for remediating oil from the soil is, a, is related to the technologies which were originally used back in the 1920s and 1930s and still in use today for the recovery of crude oil? However, today's uh, surfactant enhanced remediation projects are highly engineered descendants of that original technology that was used uh, um, in the 1970s and 1980s. And what we have is generally a system whereby surfactants are mixed on site and injected into the formation through a vertical injection well or possibly a horizontal flood. That surfactant is pulled through a contaminated zone to a recovery well where it's then extracted to the surface where the effluent is treated and uh, uh, for disposal or recovery of hydrocarbons. If we look at this in a little more detail, what we see is that the surfactant going through the injection well comes out into the formation, and as it goes through the pore spaces in this expanded view, the surfactant contacts the napple, which is uh, trapped in those pore spaces, and either solubilizes it, mobilizes it, or emulsifies it. This way, it allows that napple to be removed to the extraction well for recovery hydraulically. And today, I'm going to be talking about, uh, first, a very brief review, understanding what napple is, what the problem is. Then we'll spend a good amount of time talking about the basics of surfactant-enhanced aquifer remediation, a little bit of technology and some practical applications on how to uh, apply the surfactants. I'll talk a little bit about a couple of uh, case studies, and if time permits, we'll come back to some very detailed discussion about SEER design and operation. LNAPL, or 
will be called light non-aqueous phase liquids. It's a fancy name for basically petroleum hydrocarbons trapped in the soil, LNAPL. This is what I'm going to be speaking about today. About 80% of pink water's applications are on LNAPL, covering LNAPL from the soil. What we have in a typical situation is a, a surface spill, or in some cases a, a USD that is leaked. NAPL will migrate down through the unsaturated zone, becoming dispersed at some point uh, where it will no longer move forward. It's moving down with the forces of uh, gravity and capillary actions. And if the spill is large enough or the water table high enough, that spill will migrate down to the saturated zone where it will pool and spread out. As the water table <laughs> moves up and down, the NAPL will become trapped in the pore spaces, creating a smear zone. And it's really the groundwater that's flowing through that smear zone that gives rise to dissolved phase plumes. It is these plumes that people are normally concerned about. Because NAPL in the plumes, petroleum hydrocarbons dissolved in, these, uh, in groundwater, makes that groundwater unfit for human consumption, possibly even unsuitable for agricultural or animal use. This is a, a little close-up of what we call residual NAPL. This is a highly magnified grains of sand in a, a, a kind of an academic study. And these little blobs, these little disconnected blobs, are petroleum hydrocarbons trapped in the pore spaces of the sand. Now, residual saturation refers to the a percentage of LNAPL in the pore space, which at some point becomes immobile, below which that LNAPL will not move. It will not flow into an open bore or well. It will not move on its own accord. Water flowing by that NAPL will not move that NAPL. What it will do is contribute to dissolve phase NAPL. So the real problem is that is trapped in the pore spaces. If it can't get out of the pore spaces, it's going to be very challenging in order to uh, eliminate the dissolved phase plume. What are the options now? There's many different technologies that people apply to re removing NAPL or recovering or cleaning up a, a site. And uh, I just provided a list here of, say, five different categories. This is not to say we're eliminating anything. But the simplest and most direct uh, approach if it's possible, is to just dig it out of the ground. This has been done for many years. The question is, we say, remove the contaminated soil from the site. Can we get all of it? In most cases, we cannot get down far enough, or we can't cover enough of an area to get rid of all of that NAPL. But in some situations, excavation is feasible, inexpensive, and results in a pretty good solution. A second approach is to contain the contamination. That is done through stabilization, either by mixing the soil, the contaminated soil, with cement or clay to make it impermeable, or to physically isolate the LNAPL through the construction of a sheet pile wall that might keep that NAPL from moving down gradient towards, uh, say, a river or another body of water. A third way is extraction, that is removing NAPL from the subsurface. Uh, the simplest form of that is pump and treat. If there's a large body of NAPL, a simple well put into the ground will be able to pump that to the surface so it can be disposed of. As the NAPL concentrations decline, the productivity of a pump and treat system will also decline. We can enhance that through vacuum enhanced extraction and other technologies, but at some point, the forces that hold that NAPL in the pore spaces will overcome the forces that we can apply from the surface using vacuum enhanced technology. At that time, we may choose to use something like surfactant treatments to uh, uh, mobilize that NAPL, or more recently technologies such as you heard about this morning using thermal technologies to actually vaporize that and recover the, uh, the NAPL from the subsurface. A fourth category would be in situ oxidation or reduction. That's applying chemical or biological agents to degrade the NAPL in place. And a, a final one is natural attenuation. A little bit of the do-nothing approach, but if, we, if the spill or the contamination is an area which is considered to be low risk to uh, either human or agricultural applications, it may be possible to simply monitor the degradation of that in place over a period of time, which could be decades. 
Maple extraction, which is what I'm going to be talking about, that's uh, where the remainder of my talk is heading, is, is uh, in terms of the role of surfactants in aiding maple extraction, is sometimes looked at as a three-phase process. The primary phase, when we have three-phase maple, that is maple which is mobile in the subsurface, is some form of pump and treat or vacuum-assisted recovery. This will continue, as I said a moment ago, until uh, we get to the point where the concentrations are low and that we keep pumping or we keep uh, vacuuming and less and less NAPL comes to the surface. At this point, engineers or consultants may decide to use a surfactant flush or a surfactant flush with a co-solvent to try to mobilize that NAPL and recover it. What we're dealing with here is generally projects where the NAPL is in the residual phase. It's immobile. They've gotten as much out of the ground easily, but they're not meeting their objectives and they have to kind of go to a, a, a more advanced treatment. In many cases, surfactant flushes will remove all of the NAPL necessary to reach a site closure condition if it's in an industrial or a commercial location. In fact, one uh, DOD study a number of years ago uh, found that, I think they looked at about 15 different studies about of our sites, that about 80% of residual NAPL after pump and treat was completed was removed using surfactant and co-solvent flushing. If we are going to return a reservoir to a drinking water quality, there will be tertiary, quali tertiary treatment required, either some form of oxidation or biological uh, a chemical treatment, oxidation or reduction to get rid of the, uh, the remaining uh, nap. That takes place in the dissolved phase. The only way to really get rid of the dissolved phase plume is going to be with oxidation. Surfactants will only work on residual phase material. Okay, moving on, I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about uh, surfactant technology and how it's used. A little bit about what are surfactants, how surfactants work, and then, of course, uh, which different kinds of surfactant systems that might be possible on the sites that you're looking at. And finally, a little plug for Biosol Pink Water. So surfactant, the word surfactant, is a contraction of surface active agent. Surfactants really only work on the surface of liquids. And that's an important thing to do. When I say only work, they do a lot on the surfaces, but they're not really fit chemically reacting with any of the products in the subsurface. I think uh, surfactants are very common. There are literally thousands of different surfactants, and we see them or use them in every phase of our life. They're in everything from hand lotions to shampoos to salad dressings to paints and coatings to agricultural chemicals. They're everywhere out there. Surfactants really only do two things, but they do them very well. The first is they reduce the surface tension of liquids. What do I mean by that? Well, you've probably all seen liquid sort of uh, dropping up dew drops on, on grass or leaves in the morning, or when you spray it, you end up with a droplet of water. Well, water has surface tension. Water likes to be in contact with other water, so it beads up. Surfactants will reduce that surface tension. This is this kind of cartoon here, a droplet of water, if a, if a small amount of surfactant is added to that droplet, we're talking perhaps as little as uh, 50 parts per million, that droplet will lose its surface tension and will eventually collapse and wet the surface. That's the first thing surfactants do. The second thing they do is they lower interfacial tension. That is, the tension between liquids, such as oil and water. We all know oil and water don't like to mix or between liquids and solids, such as between oil and soil particles. We're going to talk a little more about this second point. But what is a surfactant? How many chemical engineers do we have here? All right, great. If I'm not here, we can see the person to talk to about surfactants. <laughs> what we have is a typical surfactant is, has two parts. It has what we call a head which is generally illustrated in this way, and it's a hydrophilic head, or it's a water-loving head. It also has a tail, which is a lipophilic or oil-loving tail. So the, all surfactants have these two parts. The strength of the hydrophilic head and the strength of the lipophilic tail are different in every surfactant. 
And it's the ratio of that, the strength between the hydrophilic head and the lipophilic tail, which determines how the surfactant is going to work and what applications it can be used for. But surfactants, interestingly, are uniquely attracted to both oil and water. And that's what we're going to be looking at here. In the subsurface, surfactants reduce interfacial tension between oil and soil to mobilize an apple. So this oil droplet is attached to this so these soil particles. It's adhered to those soil particles, held in place by capillary action. The surfactants in the water, the tails are highly attracted to this oil, so that oil tails insert themselves into that oil droplet. And as they do, the hydrophilic head kind of attracts water. Well, it gets so crowded on the surface that those heads are pushed in there underneath the soil particles, and they bring the water with it. And that's what helps to release the oil from those soil particles. Once it's been released from the soil particles, surfactants reduce the interfacial tension between the oil and water to encapsulate and emulsify the oil. That basically is this droplet of oil gets entirely surrounded by surfactants. It's kind of like a soccer ball where the surface of the soccer ball is all surfactants. And those surfactants, the heads of those surfactants, are soluble in water. And that's why we end up with an emulsion, where the oil and water can mix effectively in the subsurface. Under the right conditions, some surfactants will form a micellar emulsion. That's when the entire surface is covered and we get this kind of soccer ball-like structure, which is uh, very unique in terms of its behavior. We'll talk about that in a moment. Why is this important? Why do we want to kind of create this micelle under the surface? Well, emulsification or micellar emulsification, it increases the solubility. It increases the effective of solubility of oil. We're not increasing true solubility of oil in water, but we are making it effectively soluble through the use of surfactants. We reduce volatility. Well, if the oil is completely surrounded by surfactants with a little layer of water in there, it's not going to be able to volatilize. And that's why the firefighters liked it back in the introduction I was talking about. We would create this emulsion, we would reduce the VOC emissions, and we'd basically make a spill effectively non-flammable. And finally, although I won't talk about it today, a very important use and application is that it improves bioavailability. What we're doing is we're creating a lot of surface area that is in the aqueous phase, and the bacteria in the aqueous phase can then uh, get to the oil droplet for bioremediation. If we look at this under a microscope, what we see here, I don't know how visible this is back there, but, but we see a lot of different sizes of ball-like structures. These are all micelles of various different sizes, which have been formed. Um, I don't know where this is. This is not a pink water slide, but, but this is basically, I thought it was a good illustration of the range of the sizes of micelles that you would create in, in a situation like using pink water. But there's, there's some areas that are just kind of empty. This is just a void where water, uh, maybe a little unused un, uh, uh, surfactant is remaining. But these, this is what we're trying to create with the use of pink water in remediation projects. <coughs> now one very important point here is that forming a micelle, forming an emulsion in the subsurface requires mechanical action. Surfactants don't work on their own. They need to have some kind of energy applied. If we simply take oil, in this case diesel fuel, which I've dyed blue for contrast, and we look at it sitting on the surface of pink water. This is a 5% solution of pink water. Lots and lots of surfactant molecules in there. No emulsion. All of those surfactants, or as many can, can fit, are sitting right at the surf layer, right at the interface between the diesel fuel and the pink water, but there's been no mechanical action to uh, get those layers to mix. If we do mix it, if we take up that jar and we shake it very briefly to provide a little mechanical energy, we form an emulsion. Looks like a very homogeneous mixture. If we let that sit for about 30 minutes, it will separate. We can't violate the laws of physics. The, uh, the fuel is lighter than water. The emulsion is a very thin layer on that, uh, that fuel the emulsion will come to the surface. And this is actually a very good characteristic because it allows someone to use an oil water separator to skim off the emulsion so that you'll end up with a relatively clean aqueous phase underneath. 
And I used to say, well, how much mechanical energy do I have to apply? I'm not really, you know, able to do much in the subsurface. Well, pink water or any surfactant, most surfactants, flowing through the pore spaces in the subsurface provide enough mechanical energy to mobilize and form an emulsion. We've looked at simple column studies in our own lab where we simply use gravity feed to, to let that pink water flow through a soil column. And just the process of flowing through there with gravity only is sufficient to emulsify the hydrocarbons in the column. So, now that you have a little bit of the theory, where would you use? a surfactant enhanced aquifer remediation project. Well, there are some criteria. You need to pass some tests in order to really evaluate a site as being potential for using surfactants. These are the tests which we've called key success criteria. And the first one, and perhaps the most important one, is hydraulic conductivity. We really need permeable soil. If we're trying to get a product into the soil, we've got to get it into the soil. We've got to get it into the pore spaces where the contaminants are in order to react with those contaminants to form an emulsion. And quite frankly, that's true for any remediation product that you're trying to get into the soil in the area of where the contaminants are located. We've got to kind of uh, uh, get it, it has to be permeable enough to get it in. Some people ask, well, how permeable? I mean, some of you may have seen a table like this, just hydraulic conductivity, but typically we need to be above this. We need to kind of be above 10 to the minus 3 in order to really be effective. There are some people that are pushing that limit on occasion. We try to caution them that you either got to have that well right in the middle of the contaminated area where you're injecting this, or you need to be have, a, have, a, have permeability in the soil that allows you to move that uh, surfactant through that area. The second uh, test is surfactant volume. We've got to have enough surfactant volume. We have to get enough surfactant volume in there to contact the pore spaces where the contaminants are located. Typically, if we can identify an area that we want to treat, we like to see about somewhere between 0.5 and 1 pore volume of surfactant solution injected into that area. And even at that level, there's an old adage that goes back to the advertising days, but I might say it here is when you inject a surfactant, we only know, we know that only half of that surfactant is doing any good at all. The problem is we just don't know which half. If we knew that, we'd probably be able to, to figure out exactly where to put it. The third test is soil composition and chemistry. In addition to being permeable, Soils with a lot of organic material or a lot of clay may reduce the effectiveness of surfactants. The clay will act to absorb the surfactant material. The organics may also in, inter, uh, interact with the surfactants and make them less available to react with the napple. In some cases, groundwater with high mineral content may not be compatible with surfactants as well. Always a good idea to test the groundwater to make sure we don't have any precipitation or loss of surfactant. Soil. Excuse me. Thank you. Finally, hydraulic control. The injections need to be within the extraction well radius of influence. We have to get it into the ground. We also have to get it out of the ground. So we want to recover the pink water together with the residual hydrocarbons that have been removed. And the best way to do that is to make sure, for example, in this drawing, if this is our extraction well, that we've got the injection well somewhere in this radius of influence to assure that the material we're putting into the ground is going to be pulled through to the extraction well and taken out. So we want to get it into the ground. We want it to make contact with the napple. We want to keep it working over the duration of the project, and we want to get it out of the ground. If you pass those four tests, then we can consider what kind of surfactant system we want to use. And there are three types of surfactant systems that are generally in use. Solubilization systems, mobilization systems, and emulsification systems. Now, in fact, most surfactants do all three. Almost all surfactants will increase true solubility a little bit. They will do some mobilization, and they'll do some emulsification. But different surfactant formulation, formulations will do one of those things much better than the others. So depending on the site and your objectives, you want to choose a system 
that is, um, uh, will optimize on one of those three uh, points. Solubilization, I said, increases true solubility. Solubilization systems almost always use a co-solvent, such as an alcohol, because alcohols are soluble both in many petroleum hydrocarbons as well as in water, and that will increase the true solubility of in, in the uh, solution that's going to be uh, uh, extracted from the subsurface. Mobilization systems are trying to reduce the oil-solid interfacial tension to release the oil. <coughs> What we're doing is trying to create a very slippery, slippery lay, uh, layer right at the surface of the soil. And if you want to think about this as a metaphor, think about an air hockey table. We're, we're trying to create that air layer right along the soil particles that will allow the napple to slip through the soil. Emulsification, an emulsification system is very good at reducing the oil-water interfacial tension to form an emulsion. In this case, as I showed earlier, we're encapsulating that oil droplet in this uh, the surfactant. We're essentially creating a greased pit. We're creating the napple. We're making the napple really slippery so that it flows through the soil rather than necessarily creating the soil very slippery so the napple will slip through the soil. Three different approaches. All three represent aggressive source zone mass removal. And as I said before, you know, the surfactant selection is based on the dominant mechanism target for the site. Uh, this is a kind of a, a much of an eye chart here, but uh, there are different characteristics of surfactant systems. Typically, uh, a solubilization system is a non-ionic or an anionic uh, surfactant, but often with co-solvent. Mobilization systems tend to be anionic. They also tend to be highly tailored for individual sites because the chemistry of the groundwater is very important to get them to work effectively. And, oops, uh, emulsification systems almost always tend to be non-ionic. Non-ionic surfactants are better emulsifiers and they work very effectively with petroleum hydrocarbon in that regard. Some of the real differences occur in effluent treatment. If you're solubilizing the napple, it is a bit of a challenge to treat the effluent. It's much harder to treat a solubilized effluent than it is to treat, say, a mobilized or a uh, um, emulsified. Mobilization, a simple oil-water separation, and emulsification, very much the same thing. We really uh, can just separate the emulsion with uh, an oil-water separator or a frac tank. Um, solubilization systems tend to be for larger sites. They tend to have a relatively high cost footprint. Um, mobilization, there's a little more upfront in terms of the injection and the control of the chemistry, but they also used on, on larger sites. Emulsification is, is, a, is, a, is a bit of a nice blend between the two. They're relatively easy to execute. The effluent is relatively easy to treat. They tend to be used, they're good on large and small, but I'd say they tend to be used more on small and medium sites. Mechanisms aren't mutually exclusive, as I said. Um, we are working with uh, Tufts University here in, in Boston and, and uh, with uh, Dr. Andrew Ramsberg and he's been doing a lot of testing and product development with us and he's proposed this model for looking at these different systems in much the same way as the soil texture triangle that many of you are probably familiar with. So we're looking at solubilization, emulsification, and mobilization as the three uh, dimensions on that triangle. And he has uh, kind of taken a look at some of these um, uh, different projects. Um, you know, Hill Air Force Base, which was uh, which he's classified. And I don't know why it's turned into a block instead of one, but that's uh, uh, the way it is. As kind of a, you know, midway between sort of a solubilization and mobilization site, uh, the Bachman Road ethoxylated sorbiton monoleate was more of a true solubilization site. Uh, Bixby Golden Oklahoma State site, uh, sulfosuccinate uh, was really so much more of a mobilization with some solubilization. And then we looked at a couple of the biosol products. This is a pink water, our pink water, which I'll talk about in a minute, a, a, a site where we were recovering uh, gasoline range organics. And, and that is primarily an emulsification surfactant. Almost all the removal is done through emulsification. And uh, the column tests that we've been doing with our new product, Activator, are really uh, kind of halfway between the most, they get about half the benefit from one and half the 
other. Um, just one point on this, this uh, mobilization and emulsification do work together. This was a bit of, I won't say a surprise, we were hoping we'd get this from this development, but it was nice to have it confirmed. This is a column test at, uh, at uh, Tufts University. And I don't know if it's highly visible, but the, the red, the napple, has been dyed red in this column and it's spread evenly throughout the column. What we found is after one poor volume of flush, we had mobilized a lot of that, that napple. A lot of this napple that was down throughout the column has been pushed up towards the top of the column, which was, I, I think we were very pleased to see that kind of mobilization, that we were reducing the uh, interfacial tension and getting that sort of mobilization. Uh, over here we see some sample vials that were taken about every five minutes during the column test. I'm glad it's a graduate student doing this work, not me. <laughs> and uh, we could see the layer of free product and gradually more emulsion. So we started off recovering a lot of free product and over time uh, ended up with a lot of emulsion. Pink water, we have two of these two products. We have uh, pink water, which is a very strong emulsification formulation, and then um, uh, activator, which combines emulsification and uh, mobilization. We have gallon jugs over there if you want to take a look at them. Both are highly lipophilic formulations, highly attracted to oil, optimized for fuel range hydrocarbons. They work at very low concentrations, very low CMCs. That's a critical micelle concentration that's required in order to form an emulsion. Emulsions are very stable. They don't leave any residue behind. One of the one of the issues that a lot of contractors, particularly vac truck operators, say is when they vac the site with uh, pink water that their trucks are absolutely clean. There's nothing in their hoses, nothing in their truck. It's all been completely removed. And our products are, are compatible with, uh, oops, got a little ahead here, uh, compatible with tertiary treatments. A uh, number of contractors, engineers have specified pink water in advance of uh, oxidation. <coughs> Finally, uh, water-based, non-hazardous, no solvents, and they are biodegradable. I'm going to move quickly to a, uh, a uh, case study. Uh, this is a uh, service station in western Massachusetts. And um, just this was, uh, you know, gasoline-impacted soils were uh, encountered back in, in 1988. Probably not too different from a lot of sites that you may have seen, the long, long history of, of of the site with a number of different uh, cleanup phases. Um, they, they, re they replaced the USTs, then they did, ex they, in the process, they, they excavated and did three years of dual phase uh, extraction, they removed about a thousand gallons of gasoline. In September 2000, the USTs were removed altogether. They were still finding uh, uh, gasoline in a number of wells at the site. Uh, they took out another 1,400 cubic yards of soil. Then they did four years of uh, vacuum ex enhanced uh, groundwater extraction to try to see if they could recover that. And they still had gasoline apple in multiple monitoring wells, ranging from you know 0 0.5 feet, pretty low, to up to 5.5 feet. So Kleinfelder um, uh, was the uh, engineer on this site, and then. Uh, they put together a plan to use surfactant enhanced remediation. And that plan was submitted in December of 2011. In 2012, they began work. The objective was to meet conditions for no significant risk at the site, which required less than 0.02 feet of NAPL during quarterly monitoring. If we looked at the site, there were five monitoring wells of concern in these locations. Uh, they actually completed three injection wells around each monitoring well, which they were going to use, um, and then extract from the monitoring well. Simultaneous injection and extraction conducted monthly, and the plan was 360 gallons of 5% pink water solution per area per month. And they were going to extract a minimum of three times the volume that was injected to be sure that they would pull it through the formation and taken it out of the soil. This shows a couple of shots of uh, the work going on. We, we took samples during the day. This was happened to be during a day that uh, uh, we visited the site. And uh, the site technicians were being very helpful, helped us collect samples throughout the day so we could monitor the progress of, uh, of NAPL removal. Um, here we are with 
sort of the results. At the end of the day, we had, um, uh, and this is just this, this one day uh, that, that uh, we were observing, we took these samples. This was at the beginning of the day, just kind of some murky groundwater. And about every 60 to 90 minutes, we took a sample as uh, we were able to do it in a, in, a, in a fashion that wouldn't disrupt the treatment. And what we found is we could see sort of the telltale pink sign uh, that indicated that the pink water had moved from the injection well to the extraction well. And with it, we had recovered a, a pretty fair volume of uh, emulsified napple. Very high volume, maybe about uh, 35, 40% of the volume in this first sample, and then maybe decreasing amounts over the course of the day. Uh, this was a very productive site. Uh, not all of the sites, not all of those five sites were as productive, but they were definitely uh, recovering apple. Over the course of the treatment, they injected 7,000 gallons of pink water solution. That was about a 5% solution, and recovered 22,000 gallons of effluent. And they estimated about 1,000 to 1,500 gallons of bell napple that was recovered in the course of that process. Just a little detailed picture here, just to give you a sense that some of these samples, when you look at them close, there may be a little free phase material on the surface, a very thick uh, emulsion, which is generally about 90% L-napple with a little surfactant and water entrained in that emulsion as well. Residual pink water with dissolved phase L-napple in that. And then at the bottom, there may be whatever solids are being brought to the surface with the vacuum extraction. At this particular site, they used eight different wells for extraction during six monthly events in the course of 2012. All eight wells recorded l napple prior to the treatment. From 2013 on, six wells recorded no measurable napple. One well had, on one occasion, had about 0.05 feet. That was the only time it had that. One well did continue to record l napple on a regular basis, but was determined that the source zone was from out side the site. I guess that happens uh, in some of these heavily industrial areas. I'll offer to take a few questions if we have a moment. Yes? So as the surfactant goes through um, an uh, impacted area, is there a sense of when, when the product is liberated from the pores, are the kinetics favoring that product staying as free product, or would it prefer to be, or, or does it result in, in the emulsion? Well, pink water definitely prefers an emulsion. I mean, pink water is always seeking out. I mean, pink water is barely soluble in water. I mean, the trick of the chemist who developed this product was not in making it highly lipophilic, but making it so it could also stay in solution. That was the real challenge. So it's always seeking out oil to form an emulsion. Activator operates a little bit differently. Activator tends to mobilize the material first. It's actually a very good wetting agent. We, we were hoping it would be a good wetting agent. It is a good wetting agent. So it gets in there and it breaks the napple away from the soil particles. It works a little more slowly as an emulsifying agent, meaning it takes some time after it mobilizes and as it's moving it through the formation to form that emulsion. So there's a little difference in the way that the, the mechanisms that they operate on um, that, that actually make them two very interesting products for different situations. So is that why you have the 5% the solution is limited because of the solubility of pink water? That well, you can't get more than that? The 5% solution, remember we're injecting in or near an aquifer, so we're going to get a lot of dilution too. So our, our goal is to try to keep the solution, say, um, we know it'll work down, I mean, in the lab, we can make it work at about one-tenth of a percent. But, you know, out in the world, we want to be sure we've got enough surfactant molecules that when we encounter that residual napple, that we're going to have enough molecules to form that emulsion and free that product up so we can bring it to the surface. We like to keep it at about one percent in the subsurface. Now, is Activator that product that you can use in Europe? Yes. Act Activator, I, I should have mentioned, act, one of the reasons for developing Activator, Biosolv is very effective. It works great. It doesn't meet kind of the today's standards for ready biodegradable, uh, ready biodegradable, that, that, that kind of thing, which requires that the product be 80% degraded in less than 28 days. So pink water is probably degraded, fully degraded in maybe 90 days. It does degrade, degrades fine. but 
this product that activator degrades it, it actually in about half that day, about 12 days. We, we achieve uh, 60, over 60 percent degradation in 12 days. And um, that is what's required for uh, sales in Europe and certain other countries. We're also getting questions from many states, particularly coastal states, where they really just don't want to have a lot of surfactant hanging around the groundwater for a long time. So they like to see a product that's a, a more bio, biodegradable, more friendly product. Activator is also, we, we haven't received the certification, but we've applied for the EPA Safer Choice certification for Activator, uh, meaning that all the ingredients are on what they call their skill list, their safer chemical ingredient list.